Hello and welcome back to the virtual classroom. I'm your host, Dr. Olmsted. As you can see, today's topic is progressivism. Now, before we begin, as always, take the moment, hit pause on this video, jot down that lecture outline, and as always, pay particular attention to those key terms at the left. Make sure you, you can identify the who, what, where, when, why, be able to connect them to each other and to their larger historical significance. This will come back to be very important on your essays you have to write. Got it? Let's get started. Now, at the turn of the century, beginning right again, I'm not saying exactly, hey, January 1st, 1900, no, but right around the end of the 19th, right at the beginning of the 20th century, the, we're going to see some major changes in our country. We're going to see a change in government, for quite, quite honestly. We're going to see an end to that very passive, supposed laissez-faire government of the 19th century. We're going to see some actual reform movements be birthed. And all of this is in response to the very same thing. So the increased activism of average Americans, the pushes for regulation and reform, the involvement of government, all stem from the very same problem. You got it, that gold-plated crap. And so whereas the Gilded Age is all about this gold-plated crap, the progressive era, the progressivism, the progressive age, is all about how do we clean up that crap? How do we actually make America a better place and make America great? And so, remember, all those inequalities that existed in the Gilded Age, yep, I'm going to say it one more time, how much did life suck in the Gilded Age? Let me count the ways. And of course, wealth inequality, these monopolies, so no free, there is actually no free trade or free competition, low wages, long hours, poor working conditions, child labor, political corruption, and a very limited voting. And of course, also very corrupt voting. So before we begin, let's just get kind of the elephant in the room here. What actually is progressivism? How do you define this idea called progressivism? And the reality is it's not a simple definition because it's kind of a nebulous term that we apply to a lot of different things. And some are more liberal, some are more conservative, but they all have something in common. And ultimately, it's, a, it's an umbrella term that describes the varied responses to the economic and social problems of the Gilded Age. It rejects social Darwinism and instead emphasizes government intervention, government reform, government regulation to address inequality. That's what it is. So it rejects social Darwinism. It embraces a more active government to provide government intervention to establish greater equality and to establish some form of safety net. In other words, it is to regulate the worst excesses of capitalism because unfettered capitalism produced gold-plated crap. And so... Then, again, we, we, as historians, we kind of lump this entire era, these, all these various reform movements that we'll talk about in a few minutes, under this one umbrella known as progressivism or the progressive era. And then, of course, we have to talk about who are the progressives. Well, largely they're white middle class reformers. And this is because, that A, they have more time on their hands, and they begin to look around and say, huh, life is pretty crappy, actually, for a lot of people. How can we make things better? And what you're going to find here that you're going to see is that, remember all those populist ideas? You know, populism, the populist party, capital P, populism? Yeah, the progressives are going to adopt many of their ideals and actually begin to implement them. The populist party was just a couple decades ahead of its time. But the question then is, okay, middle class, usually white middle class reformers. Two things about them. Number one is, this makes it more respectable, right? Because 
the populist party were seen as riffraff. These were whiny farmers who were complaining about this and complaining about that, and they want Freeman to say blah, 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 blah. But when middle-class whites begin to push for reform, this brings a aura of respectability to the movement. And now these populist ideas that were shot down as being too radical are now being embraced because it is no longer the poor people pushing for it, but rather the middle class who are seen as, well, more respectable. And again, remember, they're, what they embrace is regulation. What they embrace is reform. They do not embrace revolution. They're trying to overthrow the government here, which means they were the populist party, but again, respectability issue. But the question is, how do you convince middle and maybe some upper class whites to begin to embrace progressive ideals? What pushes that forward? I mean, it's one thing to know, yeah, there's poor people. I mean, if you live around Houston, right, you know that there are poor people that live under the by docks, under the bridges, under the freeway systems, right? You know this. You know it exists, but it doesn't have a tangible quality of belief until you actually go see it. Now we can see on the news, obviously we have TV today, but how did people see things back in the turn of the century, in the 20th century? And the answer ultimately became journalism, newspapers, and other forms of journalism, books, etc. And while we had yellow journalism when it came to the idea of the Spanish-American War, there was another new form of journalism that was developed in the late 19th century, and that was known as muckraking journalism. Now, what is muckrakers or muckraking journalism? So the, the term is muckraking journalism, but the people who did it, the journalists, are called muckrakers because they're raking through that muck. They're stirring up that muck so other people can see it and smell it. They're stirring up the crap, muckrakers. And so muckrakers were pretty important to the progressive era because they exposed the crap. These are reform-minded, investigative journalists who sought to illustrate to the middle and upper classes the social and economic inequalities in American life. Now, there are a number of them. Ida Tarbell is a famous one who will go on to actually debate John D. Rockefeller and basically tell him, you're an idiot, you treat your people like crap. But one of the more famous ones was a man by the name of Jacob Rees. And Jacob Rees was important because he brought a visual, visceral account of the slum areas of New York. Now, Jacob Rees, he immigrated to the United States from Denmark in 1871, and he had a pretty normal immigrant experience. He struggled with poverty. He worked low-wage jobs. He lived in dilapidated tenement urban housing, but he worked his way up, and he became a journalist and police reporter for the New York Tribune. Now, this was not the glamorous job that you might think it was. He was assigned to New York's crime-ridden Lower East Side. So he was assigned to the police beat. Basically, his job was to follow the police and or follow the police, you know, after they leave, follow up, and go into the most dangerous, dirty, dilapidated section of New York, the Lower East Side. And it's crime-ridden. It's dangerous. And he goes there, there's no electric lights there, there's no sanitation there. And you see some of the pictures on the screen. He captures people in everyday living. Look at the picture on the bottom right. How many people do you see living in a tiny, cramped room? Top left. These are not people. This is not how humans should live. And what made Jacob Reith so important was he didn't just report it with words. He pioneered the use of flash photography in low light. And he became, you know, a revolutionary in that respect you know, for photography. But in doing so, he's able to depict this poverty as it really was. 
And then he publishes it. He posts a book called the How the Other Half Live. You see the picture of the book right there. And in this book, he, you, he published his photos along with the written word to describe the squalor, the disease, the poverty. And it detailed the high infant mortality rate, the disease rate. The other issues that you know produce a low quality of life, like lack of sanitation, lack of heating. But Reese went one step further in this book. This is where he becomes what you would say is a progressive. Because traditionally, the answer is why are people living like this? And of course, back in the 1800s, we just talked about it, right? In our industrialization lecture, they believe social Darwinism. They believe that these people live like this, like you see right there on your screen, because they are morally corrupt, because they are lazy, because they lack motivation. And Jacob Rees says, no, it is not their fault. For the 99% of them, it is not their fault. Instead, he blames the situation in New York's Lower East Side. He blames these living in working conditions, not on social Darwinism that says they're lazy. No, 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 no. He blames it on the apathy of the upper and middle classes of America, that they are failing these people. Reformers like Jacob Reese believed that it was environmental conditions that caused poverty rather than sheer just laziness or moral degradation. And so it's people like Jacob Reese, it's people like Ida Tarbell and these muckrakers who began to expose it. And Jacob Reese's book became essentially a bestseller that became a, a staple on every middle class, upper class person's coffee table. It was a book that everyone had, and they're like, wait, really? That's how people actually live? And again, they knew it mentally. But there's a lot of things in life you can cognitively understand. But you can't fully grasp and have empathy for until you actually live and see it. Like, for instance, whenever you, you're going to have children, you can prepare, read all the books, and you should. None of that's going to be the same, though. You mentally prepare how hard having kids is. No, no, no. Having kids is a great joy, but you can never prepare how difficult, how time-consuming, how much everything changes in your life because now you're living for them. The kids are first. Well, it's the same way with this poverty situation. He exposes it and shows poverty in its naked form. And as a result of people like Jacob Reese, these muckraking journalists, we will start to see people push for reform. Now, to make this a little bit better for you, I've broken it down into a different categories. What we'll call the prongs of progressivism. Remember, progressivism is an umbrella term. And so each of these categories you see here, democracy, social justice, prohibition, women's suffrage, regulation, each of these things each of these prongs of progressivism represent a different facet of it. And we're going to go through each one of these and provide a few choice examples to understand just how diverse. Remember, this is not one thing. So let's start with democracy. Democracy. One of the very first things that the progressive era did when it comes to democracy, they wanted to democratize the process of electing officials. Right? This is what they wanted to do. And, you know, for instance, give you an example, just, you know, very recently, um, this is 2020, and in the last year, there's been what's called the primary season. And these primaries, of course, are designed where all the different candidates who want to be president, they all campaign and they campaign for your vote, and then you vote on the one you want, and then that, so in the case of the Democratic Party, they had 22 people running for president, and through the primary season, we whittled it down to there were down to two. You had Bernie Sanders, you had Joe Biden, and finally, it looks like there's enough votes to Joe Biden will be the presumptive nominee for, pre for president to compete against Donald Trump in 2020. But did you know that 
This is actually a fairly new phenomenon in American history. In fact, prior to the progressive era, you had no say in who was going to be on the ballot in November. In other words, in the old days, those 22 individuals who wanted to be the Democrat nominee, they would have basically went and they would have said nothing to no one. And instead, what would happen is some person who you have no idea who they are, a group of men, probably in a smoke-filled room, would say, hey, I want that guy. Which you might think, well, who cares? You're still choosing for the president, right? True. But do you think we would ever get a woman nominee? Now, whether you liked Hillary Clinton or not is irrelevant to my conversation right now. She was a viable candidate who was female for the first time in U.S. history running for president, right? Do you think that a bunch of rich old white men in a smoke-filled room would ever choose a woman? Well, no. Do you think a bunch of rich old white men in a smoke-filled room would ever chose Barack Obama? No. But the people in the primary voted for them because of the fact, and if you remember back to the 20, or 2008 election, most people believe Hillary Clinton would be the nominee. And we'll get there at the end of the semester. But through the primary season, the people chose Barack Obama over Hillary Clinton. That was something that never would have happened in the 19th or 17th century. 19th or 18th century, sorry. And so this is called the direct primary. In other words, we get to vote who we want to see on the ballot, which allows people to put on people who represent them better. You get more African American, you get more women, you get more you know, LGBTQ candidates as a result of the fact that people are allowed to vote directly for who they want to see on the ballot. Another important prong of democracy, uh, another example of this, was the direct election of senators. You see, up until 1913, I told you this already in the previous lecture, and during the populist lecture, we didn't vote for senators. Me, you as an individual, would not be able to vote for senators. Instead, we voted for our state legislatures for Austin, here in Texas, and then the state legislator would nominate and send two people to Washington. Again, you're taking the power of democracy away from the people. And it was the progressive movement that finally, with the 17th Amendment in 1913, we will now have we have now, which is the direct election of senators. We get to choose whether we want Beto O'Rourke or Ted Cruz, if you're here in Texas. So again, it was all about making democracy, well, more democratic, hearing the voice of the people. Next one, social, ju or social justice issues. There's a couple of examples here. The first one is what's called the Settlement House Movement. You see, one of the big issues, of course, that we talked about with Jacob Reese is immigrants coming to urban centers are living in squalor. They have trouble finding jobs. They have trouble finding housing. They have trouble learning the language and assimilating because they live in their ethnic neighbors, ethnic enclaves. And most often up until this point, it was always seen as, well, it's their fault. They don't want to. They are morally decrepit. They're lazy, blah, 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 social Darwinism. Well, these settlement workers, settlement house workers, rejected that idea. They rejected social Darwinism like all the progressives, almost all of them did. And so these settlement house workers, usually middle class volunteers, people like Jane Addams here, they would work at settlement houses in poor neighborhoods. So what do I mean by this? So they go into poor neighborhoods, into these poor neighbors. And the first one, big one was in Chicago. And in Chicago, they went to one of the poorest neighborhoods, Jane Adams did, and they renovated a place called Hull House. Now, it used to be the governor's mansion back in the day, and the, it was dilapidated. It was no longer used, and they bought it and fixed it up back in the 1880s. And so this was a prominent Chicago mansion by the name of Charles Hall. It became known as um, Hull House. And so they bought it, and they raised the money. They volunteered, they fixed it up, and they opened what was known as Hull House. And so what did you do there? Well, this was a place that poor members of the community could come. Now, you didn't just come here just to get a free ride, just to get a hand. No, no, no. If you were there, you worked, 
you could eat there and find a meal. You could learn how to cook different foods. Because quite honestly, I mean, cooking is cooking, granted. But if you come from, you know, someplace in, say, Poland, you come to the United States, are you necessarily going to know all the foods that are available in the United States that were not that are now available that were not available in Poland? Like, how do you cook some foods? Education. There were, you know, job finding services at Hull House. You could learn English, so English language classes, so you could participate in society better, so you're not being exploited by your boss. So on the one hand, while it is good to be able to retain your language and culture, that's a good thing for immigrants. There's a negative side is you're more easily exploited by your employer. And so Jane Addams would offer English courses so they could participate in society, they could vote better, not be taken advantage of. And the idea was to provide, I guess, in theory, they're trying to make immigrants assimilate quicker. That is true. And there's an argument to be made that was a bad thing or a negative thing because it stripped them of their culture. There is that argument. But these women were doing it out of a good place. They were trying to help people get established, help them rise up above their poverty. They were saying, it's not your fault. This is not social Darwinism. And while you're there, yes, you will do some work, you will do some cleaning, you will participate, and the results were dramatic. By 1911, Hull House had expanded to 13 different buildings throughout Chicago. And then eventually this would expand to cities around the country. Now, they weren't all called Hull House, obviously, and Jane Addams didn't control them all. But she was the founder of this movement in Chicago. It was a place for food, shelter, jobs, helping. It allowed immigrants time to integrate and assimilate. That's just one example. Again, social justice. Provide help so people can access this equality in full U.S. citizenship. Another example, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Now, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on Manhattan Island in New York City. Now, it is still around today. It's part of NYU. It's actually the, called the Brown Building, which is the uh, part of the science program at NYU. But in the early 20th century, you see the building here. This was a factory building, and various companies rented out different floors of this building. Now, the Triangle Shirtwaist Company occupied and rented out the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor. So they, owned, they controlled three floors, the 8th, 9th, and 10th floor of this, of this building. And it was owned by two men, Max Blanc and Isaac Harris. And what a shirt waist is, is women's blouses. So fancy looking shirts for women. What often you see female teachers wear, blouses. Now, I know now you see my shirts. The old name for them was blouses. The old name back in the turn of the century was shirt waist. Now, like met most factory studies, this was a decrepit, horrible place to work. Long hours, low pay, poor work conditions. And on these three floors of this building that were rented out, 8th, 9th, and 10th floor, right around 500 people worked there, mostly young immigrant women. And yes, the conditions were horrendous. These women worked usually nine hours on weekdays, plus a seven-hour day on Saturday for a total of 52 hours on average. The, dangerous, the conditions there were dangerous. You see the wood floors. There's constantly loose scraps of fabric on the floor, which means slipping hazards. And what made it worse, though, was that this is not just at the shirtwaist factory, but pretty much everywhere across factories. Often, bosses and foremen would lock the doors so you couldn't leave the building. Because what they found was too many of these immigrants were, and these workers were, wasting company time by having a cigarette break, right? They're wasting time. They're not doing their work. They should be working constantly. Many of these places, you couldn't even get a bathroom break the entire time you're there for the nine-hour shift. This is normal at factories back in the turn of the century. Again, gold-plated crap. The worst excesses of capitalism. And so, in this case, often the doors are locked. The, you know, there's no fire or, like, no safety standards. Like, you know, if you're in a school building, you have 
periodic inspections by the firemen to make sure everything's safe. You have fire extinguishers. You have no thing hanging close to the ceiling. You have escape route. These are all things you would normally do now. There was none of that back in the early 20th century. It was a free-for-all. And therefore, accidents were common. Well, the biggest accident, though, came on Saturday, March 25th, 1911. A fire started in a scrap bin, so a wastebasket for scrap fabric, in the corner of the eighth floor. So basically, picture this room you see right here. In the far back corner back here, on the eighth floor, there was a scrap bin where you put your scraps of fabric after you're done cutting them. And in the scrap bin, wastebasket, a fire was started on the eighth floor. Now, and it's right underneath it. And what we found out later on through investigation, it was most likely caused by a worker cigarette who was sneaking a cigarette break. So yes, it was caused by the people who worked there. That's true. But the problem, and again, they're sneaking cigarette breaks because they're not allowed to go outside. They're not allowed to open the windows. They're trapped there for nine hours a day. So the quick the fire sparks quickly on the eighth floor because remember this is all fabric. This is wood floor. It's going to burn quickly. And so the employees on the eighth floor were able to use the telephone and call up to the tenth floor and say, "Hey guys, there's a fire. Get out." However, before they were able to telephone the ninth floor, the cable the phone line was cut and burned. And so the ninth floor has no idea what's going on now. Now, good news, though, guys, there's good news. So you see the aftermath here, how bad the fire is. There's good news here. There are a number of potential exits for those people on the ninth floor. There are two freight elevators. So there's two elevators to get down. There's a fire escape. And there are two stairwells, two stairways that lead down the street. So we have two elevators, freight elevators. We have two stairwells. And we have a fire escape, so we have five possible exits. Well, one of the stairwells, so we have five exits, right? Here's five. One of the stairwells was locked. So now we're down to four. The other stairwell, a few people were able to escape, but very quickly it was engulfed in flames. So now we're down to just three. Oh, freight elevators, which yeah, I know you all know, never get an elevator during a fire. True. However, when the stairs are closed, you might want to try the elevator so you don't burn to death. And so the employees began to jump on the freight elevator. Now, one of them was immediately closed off due to flames. Now we're down to two. The other freight elevator was crammed full of women and a couple of the men who were the bosses. And a load of women were able to escape. And as the story goes, one of the women, there were sisters there. One sister got on the elevator. The second sister was running toward the elevator, and it closed the doors before she's able to get on. So the one sister was able to escape, but the other sister was stuck on the ninth floor. That elevator will never come back up to the ninth floor because the fire burns it off. Now we're down to one. The good news is, hey, it's a fire escape. So they're able to open the window, which is the first thing. But there's been no maintenance on this fire escape for years. It's rickety. It's rusty. And by the time you pack a bunch of women on it who are screaming, trying to get out of the building to save their lives so they don't burn alive, when all the women start getting on it, the fire escape collapses. And what you get then is what's called blunt force trauma. Yes, those are dead bodies. Now, I'm always amazed by this picture because what you see here is these women who fell to the ground dead due to body hitting the ground. But I'm always struck by the fact that you look in the background at the men standing there, the policemen, the two men, the nice hats, they're not looking at the dead bodies next to them. They're looking up. Why? Because there's still women in that building. There's still women who are in the ninth, on the ninth floor 
who now have no escape. Their choice now is either A, be burned alive, or B, attempt to jump nine stories down and hope you don't end up like the women already there. And a number of them will attempt to jump, and of course, they will die of blunt force trauma. In total, 62 people died jumping from the ninth floor. 62 out of 146 total dead. Dying from smoke inhalation, burning, or blunt force trauma from jumping. Now, I know you'll all be very happy to hear this. The owners of the building were able to escape to the roof of the building and they will survive the fire. So yay, the owners are okay though. I know you're all concerned about them. They were there that day. However, they will be put on trial and they will be acquitted of all charges. That's right, they are found not guilty of any criminal charge because the prosecutors failed to prove that the owners knew that that doorway or the door to the stairwell was locked. But don't worry, justice will still be served because the owners will lose the civil suit. Now, if you don't know law very well, there are two types of cases you can usually bring in this kind of you know case. You can bring the criminal case, in which case you have is a very high standard of burden or high burden of proof beyond all shadow of a doubt, all reasonable doubt, that they will be convicted and sent to jail. They were acquitted in the criminal case. There's also a civil case where you can basically it's a wrongful death. It's not murder, no jail time, but you can be forced to pay restitution for wrongful death. In this case, they will be found guilty in the civil case, and they will be forced to pay $75 per deceased victim. So let's see, let me get my calculator out here. Let's see my little phone here. Let's see, there was 146, yep, 146 times $75. Oh no, they have to pay $10,950. Let's just round up to 11,000 to make it easy for numbers. These poor owners, they not only lost their business to the fire, but they have to pay $11,000 in restitution for wrongful death. Now, you all know I'm being facetious, but don't worry, guys. I have a feeling they're going to be okay because they have insurance on their building because they, they didn't cause the fire. One of the employees did. And the insurance payout will be $60,000. Yeah, you heard that right. Yeah, they had to pay $11,000 out for the death of these women, for 146 dead women. They will actually profit almost $50,000 do the insurance payout on this Triangle Shirtwaist Factory burning. And they, the thing is though, is this event, this idea that these women could die, these owners would basically get off scot-free and actually profit from this, made national headlines. A picture like this ran across the country in newspapers. Muckraking journalists use this to push forward social justice and worker rights. Now it's a slow process. And we're gonna see at the end of this lecture how this kind of plays out on the political stage. But this begins a big push for regulation and reform for worker rights. Now another one of these big prongs, right? So we have democracy, we have social justice. A third prong of it is prohibition. Now we're going to discuss prohibition a lot more in our during our 1920s lecture, which is a couple lectures from now. But for now, though, just realize that prohibition was the prohibition or the pro, you know you prohibit the sale or consumption of alcohol, and this was actually a progressive cause. Now you might think this is more conservative, right? Because it's kind of like taking things away. It's a moral judgment over should you drink alcohol or not. But it's still considered progressive, part of the progressive era, because you have the government stepping in, in to regulate our country, right? It's the government actually enacting laws to regulate and reform. And again, this is something that, again, women have been pushing for for years, back to the 1870s. And during 1913, they founded the Anti-Saloon League. 
to ban and push for a constitutional amendment to, again, enact prohibition to ban alcohol. Because basically the argument was people do dumb things when they're drunk and number of our mean drunks, which is why women are so involved in this movement because they're tired of their husbands beating them when they're drunk. And as a result of this, in 1920, the 18th Amendment will be passed, which is the Prohibition Amendment. Now, spoiler alert, Prohibition is a massive failure. We'll discuss it again in much more detail a couple lectures from now. And ultimately, it will be repealed with the 21st Amendment. So just realize this is a prong of progressivism. It's using the government to regulate and reform society, to try to clean up the crap. And alcohol consumption was seen as crap. So the 18th Amendment will be passed in 1820. It'll be repealed by the 21st Amendment in 1933. But for a good 13 years, we actually had banned alcohol as a nation. Next prong, women's suffrage. Now, again, this is white middle-class women once again. Now, I'm sure the state of Texas, I've seen some of their, you know, standards. They want me to tell you the good, wonderful story of famous conservative women like Susan B. Anthony. And again, I'm not trying to downplay her importance. She's important. But because she was very proper and she was out there marching peacefully. And yeah, you should know me by now. I don't tell those stories. The progressive era, women became much more radical. They said enough is enough. We demand suffrage. We demand the right to vote. We deserve the right to vote. We are Americans. And they began to organize marches. They began to organize protests and demonstrations. But then American women became a little bit more radical. You see, some of our women got involved overseas in the British push for suffrage. Because British women were also doing it during the 19 teens. And I'm telling you, they were a little more radical over in England than we were in the United States. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen the old Disney movie Mary Poppins. And of course, if you remember Mrs. Banks, she's wearing the sash that says, Votes for Women, they used for the tale for the cutting at the last scene. And they have this in the very beginning, they have this song and dance about votes for women and women's suffrage. She's a suffragette. Again, that's the nice clean version that your textbook will probably tell you about. These prim, proper women, yes, they're important. I'm not trying to downplay their importance. But it's when they became more radical, they begin to get a lot more attention. For example, in England, the women organized a protest at a horse race. So you know, picture you know, horse racing, right? All the men, all the rich fat cats are up in the stands. They're placing bets on the horses. In the middle of the horse races, the horses are coming down the home stretch in front of the grandstands of all these men, who are the ones they women need to vote for to get their suffrage. One of the women throws themselves onto the middle of the track in front of the oncoming horses and is trampled to death. Now, usually when I tell the story in class, someone always snickers. Someone like, really, that's just stupid. No, this is how important it was. They were willing to die for the right to vote for all women. This is how serious it was. This is how important and vital it is to being a citizen of a country with the right to vote. Women fought and died for it. Now, one of the people there was the person you see pictured on the left, Alice Paul. She was an American who had been overseas in Britain, and she became very radicalized by this movement in Britain. And when she returns to the United States, she begins to become much more militant than the normal stories about Susan B. Anthony. For instance, in 1913, she becomes much more militant. She organizes 5,000 women to protest the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson. Because she didn't believe that even though Wilson had tacitly supported women's right to vote, she didn't believe he was serious enough to follow through on it. And so she organized 5,000 women to protest his inauguration. Because she said that Wilson didn't favor a national amendment, but a state-by-state -state thing. The result was a near riot. 
and more than half a million people watched as Alice Paul and her comrades were taken to jail, where they were stripped naked and thrown into jail as with prostitutes. This is how they were treated because they were peacefully protesting at the inauguration. The following year, 1914, she will form, Alice Paul will form what's known as the Congressional Union because she argued that the more moderate approach, the state-by-state -state approach, of the National Women's Suffrage League was not enough. She believed they needed a national amendment, constitutional amendment now. In 1917, she will be arrested again for protesting in front of the White House. She will receive a seven-month jail sentence for protesting outside the White House. While she's in jail, she will lead a hunger strike. So she will stop eating while she's in jail because she is so committed to the cause. In fact, while on this hunger strike, the prison officials will actually declare her insane because she's not thinking clearly apparently. She's insane because she's not eating, right? But the reality is this created a public outcry in support of women's rights, in support of people like Alice Paul. Again, she's the type of woman you want to idolize here. She is a woman who was convicted by her cause. Now, I'm gonna show you a little video here of Alice Paul because this is a uh, movie called Iron Jawed Angels and it illustrates this hunger strike. It's always a very powerful thing to show in class. But before I do, I wanna finish up this little thing here Great, Grant, oh, sorry, Great Britain, they will finally grant women over the age of 30, by the way, to vote in 1918 prior to the United States giving the right to women, to our women. They will eventually lower the age down to 18 in, in 1930. The United States will finally in 1920 implement the 19th Amendment, which will give women the right to vote. But yes, it is partly because of people like Susan B. Anthony but it's also a big part of people like Alice Paul. So watch this little video real quick, then we'll come back and finish up this part of this lecture. They're inside jail right now. There's Alice Paul. Eyes front! Eyes front! Hunger strike. I was standing by my window on a cold and cloudy day. Quiet! When I saw that. As I'm rolling, for to carry my mother away, will the circle be unbroken? Get her out of here. By and by, Lord, by and by. Yes, a better home awaiting. In the sky, Lord, in the sky. Lord, I told that undertaker, undertaker, he's 
yes, and that's what it took people like Alice Paul to bring the attention to the major issue, which is women's right to vote. It took their efforts to guarantee that women would have the right to vote. So all you ladies out there, men as well, obviously, but make sure you exercise your right to vote. This is 2020, there's election year, vote. Because those are the kind of things that took place to win that right. But the question now is, after all of this, how do you implement all these changes on a political level, right? So this is great, right? We have all these problems. And yes, yeah, some of them are being solved by Jane Addams, but how do you bring about a national reform movement, a ch you know, big change? And of course, the answer is get the government to step in and help regulate and reform. But that's the topic for our second half of our lecture, so until then, take care and bye-bye.